everybody. How's everybody doing? Hey, Jay, I see you. Hi, this is Becky at the Naples Preserve. Sorry we can't all be at the building today, but it's great. It's kind of cold outside anyway. You're probably glad you're sitting at home or in your office. So today's program, where we're really lucky to get him, is Jay Kissel. He's with Big Cypress National Preserve currently. He spent the last six winters down here working with education with the sixth graders, right, Jay, from Swamp? And he was originally, he grew up in California. And I think you're going to be able to tell by his program, he's a former teacher. He taught first and fifth graders. So uh, I don't know, Jay, hopefully we're, well, we'll go back to our first and fifth grade years. So he makes a great ranger because he has that history of being a teacher. He's been with the National Park Service for seven years now. And in the winter and the summers, they send him out west. So if you go to any national parks out there, check it out and see if you can find him out there. So I'm gonna share, let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to make Jay the host now. So everybody, I'm gonna sit back and enjoy this program too. So Jay, here you go. All right, thank you very much. It says I'm now the host, so I'm hoping I'm gonna do this all right. Uh, a little different this year in that we're not face-to-face -face and we're still learning that technology side of programs. So bear with me just a little bit. Uh, I am gonna ask that at the end of the program, I'll take questions. So if you have questions, if you hold them to the end and then you, or it comes up while I'm talking about something, type it into the chat box. And then at the end, I'll go back and read those questions back to the group and I'll answer your questions if I can. Uh, if you give me just a minute here, I'm gonna set my screen up. Did he ask how to do it? Did he come up? Did he screen? You should be sharing the screen now. All right, so would you just give me a thumbs up if my screen looks good? All right, thank you very much. And I got one last thing to get out of my way here. All right, so good morning. Uh, as Becky said, I'm Ranger Jay from Big Cypress National Preserve. Uh, the Big Cypress is the very first national preserve in the national park system. Big Cypress is one of 423 national park units. They're spread all across the United States. I'm hoping that you have gone out and visited a few of them at least. My last count, I was at 210 that I had been to out of the 423. Um, like I said, there's at least one in every state. Here in Florida, we've got 11. Four right here in our backyard to go out, out and explore. We've got Big Cypress, and that's... This one right here is 729,000 acres, and it's about 40 miles east of Naples. And so I-75 runs through it, and Highway 41 runs through it. So hopefully if you've gone to the other coast, maybe you've stopped and gone for a walk here, gone to the boardwalks, it's a great place to go birding. We have five different habitats here. We start at that very high end uh, with the hardwood hammocks. And then slowly we come downhill and we'll have the Florida slash pines and then we have the prairie and then the cypress swamp and finally the mangrove estuary. Now there's not many roads here so looking for wildlife sometimes can be a little challenging but there are lots and lots of predators out here to see if you just open your eyes. So as Becky said, normally the majority of my job is working with the sixth graders here in Collier County. They get to go on science field trips with us. This year it's being done virtually. The rest of the team that I work with today, they're out in the field with iPads uh, streaming to one of the schools. So, you know, we're, we're making adjustments. Besides working with the sixth graders and doing presentations like this, we also do uh, bicycle trips, canoe trips, and, and wet walks. Now in the summertime, Becky said, uh, most summers I go to Yellowstone. My wife and I work for the concessionaire there and we get to drive these fun old yellow uh, touring cars. They're from the 1930s. 
the last summer I was in Arches National Park in Utah. Uh, let's see, I've been in Sequoia in California, Hubble Trading Post National Historic Site in Arizona. I spent one summer working at Denali State Park in Alaska. So I'm, I'm getting around a little bit. I've been to all 50 states. I'm going to see if I can work in all 50. But today, you tuned in because you want to find out what is the perfect predator. And I want you for just a moment to consider all the predators we have here in Big Cypress. And which one would you choose as the perfect predator? What, what skills would that predator need to be the most successful? Well, it could be physical size and the ability for the alligator to overpower its prey and drag it into the water and drown it. Or it might be speed. The wood stork has these quick reflexes. It's a tactile feeder. It doesn't see its food. It touches it with its beak and the beak closes at 1 40th of a second. That's about three times faster than you can blink your eye. Or maybe it's superior eyesight. With really big eyes, the advantage in dim light is obvious for owls. Or maybe it's hearing. Bats have extreme hearing. They use echolocation to detect their prey. Or maybe it's agility. Bobcats spring from ambush to capture their prey unaware. Or is it camouflage? To an unsuspecting fish, this egret looks like a white cloud floating in the sky. Or is it large teeth? Panthers kill their prey with a quick, sharp bite to the neck. So is it strength or speed or an enhanced sense or agility or camouflage? or sharp teeth that make a successful predator? Or is it a combination of those? Well, I'm gonna let you know the secret. I've shown you a picture of what I think is the perfect predator. But before the big reveal, you're gonna come back with me in time. We're gonna travel back 300 million years ago and look for the prehistoric version of this predator. Uh, the climate is warm and humid. We're in a dense, swampy forest. There's mosses and ferns. The gigantic horsetail fern reaches above our heads. There's conifers and ginkgo trees. And there's the sound of insects, spiders, scorpions, and over 300 types of cockroaches moving about under the, in the underbrush. But there's also flying insects. In fact, we're gonna see the largest insect that ever lived. The griffin fly is the ancient ancestors of dragonflies, the perfect predator. Now this griffin fly, it has a body that measures 17 inches long and a wingspan of 28 inches. So it's about the size of a gull. Can you imagine a swarm of griffin flies moving across the landscape? So just to kind of put this in perspective, here's a little, little chart that shows in scale what a modern day human would look like compared to that prehistoric griffin fly. Those things were huge. And how do we know about these huge insects from 300 million years ago? We find fossils of them and in all places in Kansas. So maybe we need to come back to present day and let's take a look for dragonflies. The weather's warm and humid. There's a dense swamp forest with mosses and ferns and cypress trees. And there's lots of insects. It sounds kind of like 300 million years ago, except the insects today are much, much smaller than their ancestors. Now scientists attribute this at least in part to the change in the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. We actually have less oxygen now than we did 300 million years ago. And they think that attributes to this smaller size in insects. Now, dragonflies are this diverse and really widespread species. They live on every continent except Antarctica. There are over 3,000 species worldwide. 
there's at least 100 documented species here in Florida. So let's start off by talking in general terms about dragonflies. And then at the end, we'll kind of look at some of the common dragonflies here in our area. And along the way, I'm going to talk with you about why dragonflies are this great predator. But first, let's understand a little bit about the body parts of an adult dragonfly. There's the head with those great big eyes. Then behind that is the thorax. Kind of think of it as the trunk of the animal. And then that long slender tail is a segmented abdomen. And of course, there's two sets of wings, fore wings and hind wings. Now, we can take a look at what makes this dragonfly a successful hunter, and perhaps the most obvious feature are those large compound eyes. And if we compare dragonfly eyes, eyes to ours, there's quite, uh, quite a bit of difference. We have one lens per eye. Dragonflies have 30,000 lenses per eyes. This gives them this huge, huge field of vision. The only blind spot they have is directly behind them. These multifaceted eyes increase depth perception, the detection of movement, and visual acuity over animals with lesser number of lenses. All animals view color through a light sensitive protein called opsins. Most animals use two or three or four different opsins to differentiate color. Humans are called trimatic, and we see a combination of three colors, red, blue, and green. Dragonflies, though, they utilize between 11 and 30 different opsins, depending on the species and depending on the time period in their life. These uh, wide range of opsins allow them to see from the color orange through ultraviolet. And if you remember your rainbow, we're missing a color here. Dragonflies can't see red. Researchers have discovered that dragonfly eyesight adjusts to their environment at different ages because they utilize different options at different ages. And they're also looking into the possibility that dragonflies can see polarized light. Now, if you examine the eye of a dragonfly closely, you might notice a dark band or spots on it. These are acute zones. The placement of these zones in different species that are in different spots in different species. And scientists are looking at the possibility that these acute zones, when they're placed high on the eye, it might aid the dragonflies that migrate. In addition to these two large compound eyes, dragonflies also have three eyes with simple lenses. And if you look really close in between those antenna, you can see them. These three simple eyes are used to detect light levels, and they also help to stabilize the flight of the dragonfly. Now, can dragonflies hear? No. Do dragonflies have a sense of smell? Well, that's kind of a yes and no answer. Dragonflies don't have a nose and detect smells the way terrestrial animals do. But dragonflies do have two short antenna that can detect some odors of their prey. This was discovered in a science experiment using fruit flies. That's a favorite food of dragonflies. They took a wind tunnel and they put dragonflies at one end, fruit flies at the other end that were hidden by a cotton screen. The dragonflies were released and right away they flew to the other end of the tunnel and right to the section of the tunnel where those fruit flies were hidden. So that kind of proved that they were able to smell. Now, if we looked at our eyes compared to dragonflies, this is what we would look like, at least one artist's representation of what it might look like. Our eyes would be three feet tall. But wouldn't it be cool to be able to see behind you? And it's, so it's easy to see how dragonflies get their scientific name, Odonata. This translates from Greek and it means tooth one. Dragonflies are these eating machines. Their upper jaws, their mandibles, are hinged on the side and can open as wide as their head. These sharp serrated structures are used to cut up the prey and chew pieces up for digestion. 
They also have a lower jaw. This is a, a part of the mouth that's called the labium. And this lower jaw actually shoots forward to capture prey and bring it back to the mouth of the insect. Adult dragonfly food is other flying insects, mostly mosquitoes and flies and midges. But they will also eat damselflies and smaller dragonflies in a pinch. So large sharp teeth are a benefit and that enhanced eyesight are benefits to the predator. Now behind the head is the thorax. Think of it as the body or the trunk of the dragonfly. Most of the organs are located here, but it's also the powerhouse of the insect. This has connected muscle that allows for movement of the head and the legs and the wings. Now I'm sure you've all seen dragonflies before, but have you ever seen a dragonfly walk? They have six legs, but they don't walk. They use their legs to perch. And they will use the two front legs to grasp prey and pull it towards them. Now on top of the dragonfly are the wings. And the exoskeleton is heavily braced and this allows for powerful flight muscles. These muscles power the two sets of wings. They're slightly different in size and shape. And unlike most insects where the wings are connected to plates on the thorax, here, the wings are directly connected to the muscle. This ar uh, uh, arrangement generates more power to the wings and allows them to create different wing arrangements. So with these powerful sets of muscles, these dragonflies are dramatic flyers. They can fly in any direction. They can fly forward, right, left, up, down, and backwards. Dragonflies are more nimble than helicopters with the ability to make slight adjustments, vary their speed, hover in place, and even fly upside down. As for speed, while well, dragonflies can fly 100 body lengths in three seconds. And if you work that out, that works out to about 30 miles per hour. So for us to do the same thing in three seconds, we would have to be able to run 30 yards. This set of wings adjust for different flight patterns too. The type of flight and the speed is determined by the pattern of the wing beats. Now, the wings can be 180 degrees out of sync. So two wings are up in the front, two wings are down on the back. They can have the hind, wing, hind wings 90 degrees ahead of the four wings or the hind wings 90 degrees behind the four wings. And of course, the last one is they can be synchronized. They can be in rhythm. Dragonflies will also utilize thermal updrafts and glide to save energy. Now, if you look closely at the wings, they do have patterns on them. And amateur enthusiasts use the color patterns to identify species. But scientists went and looked a little deeper. And they found out that those little black lines in the dragonfly are unique on every one, just like our fingerprints are. So speed and agility, favorite traits of a predator. Now it's hard to believe that these colorful creatures use camouflage, but they do. In territorial battles, dragonflies make use of motion camouflage. By keeping to a direct path towards its rival, the male dragonflies appear not to move, but they do get bigger. Once they get close enough, then they can surprise attack the other male dragonfly. Now it's, it's tough to be a predator. Not all hunts are successful. The wolves in Yellowstone, well, they average only a 20% success rate on their hunt. Just one in five hunts equals a kill. But dragonflies, they have a 95% success rate. They capture everything they hunt for just about. Now dragonflies, they eat hundreds of insects every day. I love dragonflies. They consume about 15% of their body weight daily. So think about your diet. How many cheeseburgers would equal 15% of your body weight? If you weigh just 100 pounds, you'd eat the equivalent of 60 quarter pound cheeseburgers every day. 
But I see a lot of heads nodding. <laughs> That's a lot, but that dragonfly does that every day. So dragonflies, they're the, they're the perfect predator. They have so many advantages. They have size, they have speed, they have agility, they have superior eyesight, and really an unmatched success hunting rate. Now, the last body section is the abdomen. Usually there's 10 or 11 sections to it. It can move up and down, but it can't move side to side. In the abdomen is the digestive tract and the reproductive organs. And now we get into the R-rated version of our talk today. Dragonfly reproduction is a bit unusual. The male has sex organs in two spots and must transfer sperm from the testes at the rear of the abdomen to the penis located at the end of the thorax. And the penis is equipped with a brush-like device that will remove the sperm of rival male dragonflies from the female. Now, when a male locates a female that's ready to reproduce, he will aggressively chase her. And then finally, when he captures her, will grab her right behind the head with the rear calipers at the end of his abdomen. This causes a reaction in her to move her abdomen up towards his thorax. When mating, they appear to have kind of a heart shape or a wheel. Often the male will stay near the female until the eggs are fully fertilized. Now, if he doesn't do this, other dragonflies will try to mate with her. So the females have adapted to this frenzy of mating. After they mate with the first dragonfly, they fall to the ground and play dead. After the males leave the area, she miraculously recovers and then moves to a wet area to lay her eggs. So she deposits these eggs in clean, fresh water. This begins a new life cycle. Here in Florida, in these warmer areas, Eggs can hatch in just five days. This begins the next life cycle for the dragonfly. It's called a nymph. And it lives underwater for up to five years. The nymph looks much different from the adult. The nymph is an aggressive hunter, though. And it eats uh, vegetation detritus, eggs, aquatic nymphs, small tadpoles, and fish. Like the adult, the nymphs use a thrusting lower jaw, remember that, that labium, to trap its prey. And like the adults, the nymphs can move quickly, but they don't have wings. They use water jet propulsion to move about underwater. Now, when the time is finally right, the nymphs will climb out of the water onto a blade of grass or other vegetation. They'll molt for the last time and emerge as an adult. This process will take some time as the wings must unfurl. Fluid is pumped into the wings to give them shape. The fluid is then drained and the tubes harden. Now the dragonfly is finally, after five years, ready to experience flight. At last, taking to the air, the dragonfly zooms off and it's going to live as an adult for two to six months. So the majority of its life is actually spent underwater and most of us never ever see them. Now scientists are studying dragonflies. Those compound eyes are being studied as alternative ways for people with vision loss to see again. And drones are being built that can mimic their flight patterns of dragonflies, including having the wing pairs work independently. And dragonfly nymphs are also a focus of scientific study. The Dragonfly Mercury Project is a citizen science project with the University of Maine. Led by National Park Rangers, students visit park sites to collect dragonfly nymphs for study. The focus is on mercury accumulation in the ecosystem. So this study began in the winter of 2010 Big Cypress was one of the very first sites chosen to be in this pilot program. The next winter, there were 12 sites, and the program continues to grow each winter. There are now 60 National Park Service units and several state parks collecting dragonfly nymphs for study. 
And why are we collecting dragonfly nymphs? Well, they're abundant. They're not rare or endangered, and they're found around the, the entire continent. They are big enough to find easily. They live long enough to accumulate a representative amount of mercury. They don't fly very far from their home wetlands, typically. And it's much easier to sample these than something difficult like a panther. After collecting the samples, the, the nymphs are identified by the students and the rangers as to belonging to one of these six families that you see on your screen. Then they get bagged and tagged and put on ice, and then they're sent to the University of Maine for further research. Now, mercury is a naturally occurring element. It's on the periodic table, and mercury is shown as Hg. And that's a result of the Greek name for it, which translates out to mean water silver. Now, mercury was sometimes also called quicksilver. And it's the only metal that is uh, in a liquid form at room temperature. And mercury is highly toxic. Mercury is a PBT, a persistent bioaccumulative toxin. That means that it doesn't break down quickly. It builds up in living tissue and it's a toxic substance that can lead to major health problems. It can cause uh, damage to your lungs, eyes, liver, digestive system, reproduction. And if you get too much of it, it can even lead to death. Now, you remember the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland? Well, the Mad Hatter was a hat maker. And in that time frame, when you made hats, you used mercury, hence the phrase mad as a hatter. Now, mercury is also used in separating molten gold from impurities. So in early days of gold mining, there were also people that went crazy from mercury poisoning. So this term for increased concentrations of mercury up a food chain is called biomagnification. Bio meaning life and magnifi magnification to get larger. Mercury, as it moves up the food chain, stays with the thing that consumes it and it builds up. So what we're looking at here is leaf litter has 23 parts per billion. And then we move up to crayfish. they are 53 parts per billion. And dragonfly larvae, 97 parts. Fish, 223. Finally, it gets to 355 parts per billion. And of course, if you eat lots of fish, then you have more mercury in you. Less fish, less mercury. So where does all this mercury come from? It's indeed a natural element and natural sources include volcanoes and some other geological processes to bring mercury into our atmosphere. But man also has created the, a lot of mercury in the air, the most common source of mercury in the atmosphere. And that which we're most concerned about is mercury that's emitted from coal burning power plates. Roughly 40% of all mercury emitted in the US is from coal burning power plants. Now there are other sources, uh, waste incinerators, chloralkali plants, some industrial processes, batteries, thermometers, uh, gold extraction, dental fillings, all have mercury. So what can we do? Well, let's, uh, I'm sorry, let's take a look at this first. So here's the majority of these coal burning power plants are found in the Eastern US. Shown here on the map, you'll see the size of the circle indicates greater mercury emitted on a yearly basis, the EGU, that ener energy generating units, the coal plants. But remember that mercury can travel hundreds, even thousands of miles on air currents and on dust particles. So it doesn't necessarily end up near the places where it was emitted. Why do you see less in the West? Well, there's less people there. There's more alternative resources for generating electricity. There's geothermal and there's water used out West more and more. So just because we protect the land inside of a national park doesn't mean that we're immune to the outside influences. Now, 
dragonflies are a colorful and exciting species. And I think very much like Simon Barnes does here, that if you're old and you wish to be young again, if only for a moment, try to identify a dragonfly. And I'm gonna take that a step further and say, you know, when I go out and explore and I see dragonflies, I automatically feel younger. It's the one thing I see out here, and it doesn't matter if we're talking snakes or fish or bugs or bears, it's the one thing I see that brings me back to my childhood. I am just thrilled when I see these, these insects darting about the sky. I think it changes the way I think about nature. So here's a few of the common dragonflies you might see in our area here in South Florida. One of the most common is the common green darner. That long abdomen resembles a darning needle. That's how it got its name, the common green darner. Many dragonflies have wing markings and observers use these to determine the species. Some have spots or slashes, but with these bold wing markings, it's easy to identify the band winged dragonlet. Now, a larger one is the Eastern Pond Hawk. It has a metallic green head and a blue thorax. That segmented abdomen is blue with, there's some brown stripes in there. And these can actually be found from here in Southern Florida all the way up into Canada. The small Eastern Amber Wing can be identified by the size and color of its wings. It's the only dragonfly that mimics a wasp by waggling their wings and abdomen in a wasp-like fashion. This discourages potential predators from attacking. They're seeing a wasp rather than a dragonfly. One of my favorites is the Halloween pennant. This small dragonfly has orange wings striped with brown. At rest, the Halloween pennant perches at the tip of vegetation and it kind of resembles a little flag on a flagpole or a pennant. The scarlet skimmer is this bold red dragonfly. Even the eyes are red. Now, this dragonfly is a native of Southeast Asia, but it is now established in Jamaica, Florida, and Hawaii. Here's the regal green darner. And it looks similar to the swamp darner. So you need to look close to tell them apart. The regal darner has a green thorax with brown stripes. The swamp darner, a brown thorax with green stripes. Try and figure that one out. With this unadorned white abdomen, the large chunky body of the common whitetail makes this dragonfly really easy to identify and rather bland compared to most of the rest of them. The male rosette skimmer is this brilliant pink red color. The female is orange and brown. Now large black blotches on the hind wings makes this dragonfly look like it's carrying saddlebags. Most dragonflies like clean fresh water, but the black saddlebag is at home with stagnant water. Dragonflies are, are fascinating colorful creatures. They're fun to photograph, although they're kind of tough to photograph because they move about so much. But they're great fun just to watch them as they patrol their territories. I think dragonflies make us wonder with amazement how something that small can move so quickly, can move in so many directions. Their colors, their shapes, and their movement inspire us in creativity, in pottery, in jewelry, tattoos, and even they use the, the idea of the wing in this building. Dragonflies encourage us to ponder the world around us and to broaden our thoughts on predators. I wonder if there's other unsuspecting predators that we haven't considered lurking here in Big Cypress National Preserve. 
But really, that's a tale for another day. So I'm going to back out of my slideshow here and come back to where I can see you, I hope. And I'm going to check the chat room. Remember, if you've got a question, slide it into the chat room real quick. And we can talk there. Or if you're like me and you have troubles with your fingers typing this morning because it's so cold, turn your mute button off so you can talk to me. That's out on the bottom left-hand corner. Ah, Richard. I was not expecting the predator to be the dragonfly. It was surprising, but what a wonderful, thorough knowledge talk. Thank you, Richard. Andrew, thank you for the wonderful talk. Does the water have to be fresh or can it be brackish? Good question, Andrew. So dragonflies like fresh water. And I'm gonna say that with a general rule. There is one species that actually lays its eggs in salt water, but that one is in India. So here they want fresh water. Any more questions out there? Remember, you can turn your, your mute button off at the bottom if you want, if you don't want to type. Or you can you know, type. I'm a snowbird, and when I see those dragonflies come out up north, it is great. I can go back outside again. Mosquitoes, mosquitoes are not going to get me. Yeah. So like I said, they eat about 100 mosquitoes a day. I love seeing them out here. They, they take care of a lot of our problems. All right, anybody else out there? Let's see, let's see, I was talking, was that Richard I was talking to? Richard, where are you from? Well, I'm also in um, uh, upstate New York. New York. Upstate New York, okay. Between New York City and Cornell, after Oh, okay, yeah, lots up there. Uh, what can we do to encourage dragonflies in urban settings? Another good question. So one, you're gonna need some fresh water, which means a water feature in your yard or like in the parks, like uh, Freedom Park I've been to in the, in the Greenway, they both have large water features that are gonna encourage dragonflies. Unfortunately, the water features also encourage other things. So you have to kind of be careful about that. Uh, Plant-wise, I don't know of anything that will encourage them one way or the other for plants. And then Andrew also asked if communities really release dragonflies. And I've not, in my research, I've not heard of any communities releasing dragonflies. Um, wow. I don't know how they would collect the eggs to release them. So you'd have to collect the nymphs. Remember the, the nymphs live underwater for up to five years. And then bring those nymphs into an area and hope that they survive, that there's those other things that they're gonna need because they need prey to eat so that there's those little fish and, and uh, mosquito larvae and stuff that they're gonna eat. So I've not heard of a, of a community release on them. Be an interesting project though. All right, uh, endangered. So are dragonflies endangered? Uh, as, as a general rule, no, they're not endangered. Um, but they do face some, some problems, you know, as we grow our landscape, as we enlarge our cities, we don't always think about the habitat that we're taking over. So we do lose some of that habitat where dragonflies would live. So as, as we expand our living spaces, we need to think about how do we also keep some of those habitats. Like I said, like in the park there at Freedom Park, um, the Greenway, some of um, Slugden has a big dragonfly population. The Botanic Garden has a big dragonfly population. How about pesticide issues? And are there plenty of food sources for uh, dragonflies unlike monarch butterflies? So monarch butterflies, I'm gonna work backwards on this one. Monarch butterflies, they like the milkweed and encourage you to plant milkweed in your flower garden if you can, especially the native milkweed. There is not a problem with a food source because they eat mosquitoes. So down here in South Florida, not a big issue. As we move out to other areas, 
the food source probably gets a little thinner, but so does the amount of dragonflies that are needed there. You know, there's that balance of predator prey that has to go on. And pesticide issues, I think that's going to be an expansion of that research like they're doing with the mercury contamination. There has got to be, I would believe, some correlation between pollutants and dragonfly success because dragonflies need clean, fresh water. So if we get too many pollutants in it, it's gonna affect what's going on. All right, anything else today? Well, I appreciate you being my, my test people. Oh, I got a note coming in here. I'm gonna read this after I finish talking to you. I'll read this note back to everybody. Uh, I appreciate you being my, my test folks today because this is the first time I've done a Zoom presentation. We do Zoom with some of our groups. So thank you for putting up with me. And if you've not done Zoom before and your camera is on, this is the way we applaud people. Because they can't hear you when you're doing that. <laughs> oh, and somebody put the applause hand up. No, oh, thank you. Uh, Zoom is a great thing to use. If you haven't used it before, I encourage you to, to download the app. It's a great way to get in touch with friends or working groups. I'm working with a education group that we are scattered all over the country. I talked with them last week. I talked with a guy in Sitka, Alaska, California, Texas, uh, St. Louis, where it was snowing at the time, New York, where it was snowing at the time. So it's a great way to connect with people without having to go see them. So let's see, I have another note here. It says, we have a small pond rubber lined at the preserve and we have several species of dragonfly and damselfly species lay their eggs in it. Needs to have plants for the nymphs to climb up on when they become adult form. And that's one thing we didn't talk about was dragonfly damselflies, they are related. You can tell them apart one by how they rest. Dragonflies, when they rest, they have their wings out from their body. Damselflies fold them behind them. Damselflies are also smaller. Um, we did catch some damselfly nymphs the other day when we were catching our nymphs for the University of Maine. And they have a little tail to them when they're the nymph stage. So there are ways to tell them apart. All right, well, I'm gonna ask Becky to come back on. Becky, are you, are you still there? There she is. Hi, Becky. Hi. Jay, thank you so much. That was much more than I expected. And was everybody surprised that um, it was dragonflies he was going to talk about? I didn't know. It was a complete surprise. That was great. Great, Jay. And a lot of really good information. I learned a lot. And I think that's what's great about life. You can learn new things every day. And we're learning good things, right? Yep. So, Jay, thanks. And um, we're so happy you're down here again. Oh, it's so much fun to be down here. And I do encourage you all to come out to the preserve. If nothing else, just to take a nice ride in the country. Look for the birds. The birds are coming out right now. They're beautiful. So Jay, is everything open down at Big Cypress? Can people go in the building and what's going on there? Yeah, so Big Cypress is open 364 days a year. We're only closed on Christmas Day. Uh, the Welcome Center, which was just recently renamed the Nathaniel P. Reed Welcome Center is open from 9 to 4.30 every day. They do ask that you wear a mask when you come into the building. It's not required, but we ask you to do that, trying to keep us all safe. All the boardwalks are open. All the trails are open. Um, the river is open if you want to come in canoe or, or kayak. So we are open and we hope everybody stays healthy and we can re remain open. As I told you, Becky, I was in, in uh, Arches this summer. I didn't go until the middle of July. I was the campground host. That was the first they could open the campground that they had so many problems with, with uh, COVID and safety protocols that they delayed opening the, the campground there. So the campgrounds are open at Big Cypress then? Yeah. Campgrounds are open. We're about 85% full right now. Uh, if you want to come out and camp, it's reservation.gov to make a reservation. They, they don't have just drive-up sites anymore. But about 85% full. 
more on the weekend than in the middle of the week. And of course, we didn't talk about it, but dark sky out here is really amazing too. Is that program going on, the dark sky program? Yeah, so we're doing dark sky virtually. So just like I am talking with you, there the rangers there are, the night sky rangers are doing a virtual program. And I'm sorry, I don't remember the next date for the next one, it's on our website though. They do a virtual program and they've teamed up with the Fox Observatory over in Broward County. So after our presentation, Fox Observatory turns on their telescope and then they talk about some of the things that they can see in the dark sky with their telescope. Really good, really good. So the water high in Big Cypress, I've heard water is high in areas and so viewing the birds and the alligators isn't as good as it normally would be. The, the water has been high, yes. And it's starting to come down. Uh, just last week, Shark Valley finally opened up. They had been flooded since, uh, I don't remember what the, one of the hurricanes, one of the last hurricanes we had. They had been flooded. So they finally opened up and tours are running again. Uh, the bird life here has been slow this year. The water has been deep, but lots and lots of egrets right now. They saw roseate spoonbills yesterday when some of the rangers were out. They saw a painted bunting yesterday. So we're starting to see the bird life come, come back as the water level drops. When I started in October, there were no alligators at all out at um, Oasis. And I was out there the other day and there's all sorts of them. So as the water comes down, we're seeing more and more wildlife coming closer to the road. And Susie asked, what is the website for Dark Sky? Uh, if you typed in uh, International Dark Sky Organization, that will link you to the Dark Sky Organization, the one that accredits us. But if you go to nps.gov forward slash B-I-C-Y, that will get you to the Big Cypress website. And then there will be a page on there where you can find out about dark sky programs. Or if you go to Facebook, Big Cypress, face, Big Cypress National Preserve Facebook. Either one of those will do it. All right. I'm done. Unless anybody else has got any other questions, you probably have a little information you want to give them about upcoming stuff. So I'm going to turn off my mic so I don't bother you and you can Get that stuff out. Thanks again, Thanks, everybody. Jay. Hi, everybody. So, if you know, remind people when you see them that with these programs are being recorded. And if you go back to that uh, ldepern at naplesgov.com, Lou will be putting on as soon as we get the recording back and we do a little bit of editing, it will be there will be a link on there. So, people can watch it whenever they want or if you weren't able to see all of this and you want to see what the beginning was, you can go ahead and log in. So next week, it'll be me talking about restoration out here in the Naples Preserve. Um, we have a lot going on here right now. So good, some good things have come out of this pandemic. It's given us more time to concentrate on things that really need to be done out there, research and just helping the wildlife and the plant life here. So there'll be, a, I'll have the program on that. And at the beginning of this, we did have the slideshow showing some of the upcoming. I'm trying to get some of the people for this year that we had to unfortunately cancel this last year because of the COVID. And uh, Kara, Dris uh, Kara Driscoll's one, she was going to talk about her, about the Florida milkweed. That's going to be February 9th. And she has a plot out here in the preserve. If you come, you'll see a fenced off area with flags on it. That's her research here at the preserve. As far as I know, last time I talked to her, this is the only place in Collier County she could find this milkweed. It's very habitat specific to dry scrub. So everybody, we got beautiful weather. We're lucky to be down here in Florida. If that's where you are, we can be outside enjoying. Our building is closed and will probably reclose for a few months, but that's helping us to do other things that may be done. We're out here now working on the pollinator garden. Hopefully it'll be fully in in a week or so. 
Um, boardwalks open every day, daylight hours. So thanks everybody and have a great week here. Bye.